Welcome to Life with David. I'm David, and today I'm continuing my research into the programmable input-output features of the RP2040. Last time, I wrote, compiled, and ran PIO programs that use the C, C++ SDK to blink an LED. However, for VGA video, we have to move lots of data. The RP2040 has another neat feature, direct memory access, which we can use to send massive amounts of data with little processor involvement. So why don't you join me as I dig into how the PIO plays with DMA. Let's look at what makes direct memory access so special. Here's a simplified diagram of the RP20 bus fabric. Let's start at the top. Connecting to the Advanced High Performance Bus or AHB Lite crossbar are the four AHB Lite masters, which are the only devices that can generate addresses. They are Processor Core 0, Processor Core 1, the DMA Controller Read Port, and the DMA Controller Write Port. Downstream of the AHB Lite crossbar are 10 ports which include read-only memory, static random access memory, flash execute in place memory, an advanced peripheral bus or APB, and an AHB Lite splitter that services PIO0, PIO1, and the USB port. What's impressive is that during any one clock cycle, all four AHB masters can access any four different downstream ports. The system map has been optimized to allow as many operations to occur in parallel as possible. There's also a priority system to allow higher priority masters to access zero weight state devices such as memory with no delay. PIO is special since it attaches directly to the AHB light splitter, which is a higher speed bus than the APB. That means that PIO can achieve higher DMA transfer rates than other peripherals such as UARTs, I2C, and pulse width modulation. The DMA can perform one read access and one write access up to 32 bits in size every clock cycle. There are 12 independent channels each handling a sequence of bus transfers. If there are multiple DMA channels operating at once, access time will be divided equally amongst the channels. Not only can the processors configure and start the DMA process, but one channel of DMA can configure and start another channel, allowing for chained channel operation. Let's start by looking at the simplest DMA example I can find. It comes from Greg Chadwick's blog, Playing with the Pico. I'll include a link to his blog in the description. In this example, we'll generate a pulse width modulation wavetable at the beginning of the program and then DMA the wavetable data to the onboard LED. The LED will slowly increase in brightness until it is fully on. Since we're going to use pulse width modulation and DMA functions this time, we'll include those header files at the top of our C source program. In our main program, we'll first call the GPIO set function that sets the onboard LED pin to function as a PWM output. Then we find out which PWM slice has been assigned to the onboard LED. We use that for initializing the PWM as well as setting up the data request for the channel. Now we'll configure the PWM, first starting out with the default PWM configuration. Next, modify the default configuration by specifying that the PWM counter run at about 15.6 MHz, which is a system clock of 125 MHz divided by, in this case, 8. Now we'll initialize the PWM for the onboard LED using the modified configuration. This command sets up a single dimension array named fade with 256 32-bit integer elements. This array will hold the data that the DMA will transfer to the PWM port. This next chunk of code fills in the fade array with data for the PWM. This is simply the square of the array element number. Now we need to configure the DMA channel to drive the PWM. First, we'll claim an unused channel from one of the 12 DMA channels and grab the channel number. 
We'll use that number later to configure and start the DMA process. We'll start the configuration process with the default DMA configuration shown here. The next three statements are not really needed since they're the same as the default configuration, but I'll include them so we can talk about the configuration process. The first statement sets the size of each DMA transfer. In this case, DMA will transfer 32 bits of information every cycle. The second statement is the read increment. Because we're transferring data from an array, we want to increment the read address every cycle so that we have new data each time. The third statement is the write increment. Since we are writing to the PWM port, which is always at the same location, we don't want to increment the address. To revisit, you can see that these last three statements are the same as the default configuration. The next statement sets up what data request signal is going to request more data from the DMA. In this case, it's the PWM slice that we previously assigned to the onboard LED. There are eight PWM slices available. To get the correct one, we add the assigned PWM slice number to the base slice number. Let's look at the data request table from the RP2040 data sheet. For instance, if the slice number that was assigned to the onboard LED was 3, we would add 3 to the PWM wrap address of 24 to come up with 27. The value for DREC PWM wrap 0 is defined in the DREC header in the SDK. Okay. Now that we've configured our PWM and DMA channels and have filled the data array, it's time to start the DMA transfer. The DMA channel configuration command starts with the DMA channel number and then the DMA channel configuration. This attribute specifies where the data should be written, in this case to the counter compare portion of our PWM slice. The dot .cc at the end specifies that the counter is reset to zero. This is included in the PWM header file. The data read location is now specified. In this case, it is the fade array that we filled in earlier. The next attribute is the number of data transfers to perform. In this case, 256. The last attribute tells us when to start. It's true, so we want to start immediately. Now that everything's running, we just enter an infinite loop and wait forever. Now let's compile and build the program. I'll put a link to this and other files in the description below. Let's run the program. Wow, did you see that? How about a close-up? Maybe slow-mo. I'm guessing you're not overwhelmed. Well, that was a lot of work to fade an LED, but it gives us the basic gist of how DMA works. Now, let's expand on this program to add PIO and interrupt requests to control the data flow. After all, this is the PIO Chronicles. In this program, we're driving an LED with a pin controlled by the PIO. Here the PIO acts like a crude PWM surrogate. This program is based on one of the DMA examples provided by Raspberry Pi. There are four major parts to this project. Inside the main C program, there is an interrupt handler routine, a main routine that starts the PIO and DMA processes, and a configuration routine for the DMA. The programmable input output is a separate PIO file. Let's start with the PIO routine first. As you can see, the actual program is very simple. Just output data sent to it serially over and over again. The details are in the configuration. From the main program, we'll get the PIO instance, either PIO0 or PIO1, the state machine number, 0 through 3, the starting point inside the PIO memory where the PIO program starts, the number of the pin that controls the LED, and the clock divider that determines the speed of the PIO cycles. 
In this statement, we tell the GPIO pin to use an output from a given PIO instance. This is needed if we want to output to a particular GPIO pin, but is not needed if we're only going to read from the GPIO pin. Here we set the LED GPIO pin to be an output. In this case, we're setting one pin, starting at the data pin number, to be an output. This statement gets the default configuration for the PIO program, which will be modified by the following statements before we load it into the state machine. Here we set the out pins in the state machine configuration. Each state machine has access to a four entry FIFO register in each direction, one for data into the state machine and one for data out of the state machine. If you only need a FIFO in one direction, you can combine the two FIFO registers into one eight entry register to improve the data handling efficiency. Although we don't need high bandwidth for this example, for giggles and grins, we'll combine the two FIFO registers into an eight entry transmit FIFO just to prove we can do it. Here we set the clock divider for the PIO state machine. This determines the length of each PIO program cycle. This configures the output shift register. Here we're telling it to shift from left to right with auto pull enabled and to shift out 32 bits before auto repulling the output shift register. This loads our configuration into the state machine starting at the offset address. This starts the PIO program for our particular state machine. That's it for the PIO program. Now let's look at the main C program. Because we're going to use DMA, interrupt requests, and PIO, we'll include these headers in addition to the standard library. The PIO is going to send one bit to the LED every 10 clock cycles and repeat the same 32-bit value 10,000 times before we move to the next value. There will be 32 different values that we send to the LED. Here we define those constants. We also define a variable for the DMA channel. Now let's look at the interrupt request handler. Much like the previous example, the first time through the routine, we fill a 32 element array with data to send to the LED. We only do this the first time and bypass it after that. The next statement in the interrupt handler clears the interrupt. As we'll see later, the DMA is configured to issue an interrupt request zero when it completes transferring a block of data. We don't know at the time of program which DMA channel will be assigned. This statement clears the appropriate interrupt request zero flag by shifting a one that number of bits left to the associated DMA channel. For instance, if we were assigned DMA channel 4, this command would shift a 1 4 bits to the left as a mask to clear the DMA channel 4's interrupt request 0 flag. We'll assign the next value of the wavetable to output to the PIO. This assigns the DMA channel to start sending the value of wavetable immediately. Finally, increment the index for the wavetable. Using modulo here is pretty cool since the count will increment from 0 to 31 and reset to 0 with no logic needed. In the main routine, we'll first send a message to the assembler that if Pico default LED pin is not defined, that it should send a warning during the compiling process. Here we add our PIO program to PIO instance 0 and capture the start of the program offset from the beginning of PIO 0's program memory. This is where we initialize our PIO program, setting it to run on PIO instance 0, state machine 0, using the default LED pin, which is 25, and dividing the PIO clock rate by 10. The next set of commands configures the DMA channel. First, we'll claim an unused DMA channel and capture the channel number for use later. Then we load the DMA default configuration, which we'll modify before we use it. Here we specify that we will transfer data at 32 bits at a time. We will not increment the read address. 
we will read the same value from wavetable repeatedly until the transfer block is complete. This command ties the DMA transfer of data to the rate at which it's taken by the PIO program. Now we're ready to send the configuration to the DMA. Here we'll send our modified configuration to the DMA channel and tell the DMA to write to the transmit FIFO register of PIO0, state machine 0. We won't provide a read address yet since that's determined by the interrupt handler. We'll tell it how many transfers to make, in this case 10,000, but we won't start the transfer just yet. Here, we tell the DMA to flag IRQ0 when the DMA finishes transferring a block of data. This command sets the interrupt handler for our DMA interrupt as DMA handler that we programmed in our C program. Then we enable the DMA IRQ0 to run on this processor core. Finally, we call the DMA handler to start things going. That's the end of our main program. We just enter an endless loop and let the interrupts do all the work. Let's compile and run the program. This one's a little more exciting than the first one, but not much. But hopefully this whets your interest in what DMA and PIO can do under interrupt control. Thanks for joining me today. We got down into the weeds with DMA, PIO, and interrupts. There are a lot more cool things you can do with DMA. For instance, for extremely high data rates, you can set up one DMA channel to start another one when it's done without processor control. The C, C++ SDK and RP2040 data sheets are fountains of information. This video has gotten a little long, so I think I'll end it here. But I'm going to look at the more advanced DMA features in the future, so stay tuned. If you like this video, or you think someone else might, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. The more likes this video has, the more YouTube will recommend it to others. Also, please leave a comment or suggestion for things to do. I hope to do more of these videos, so please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications of new videos. Let's get together next time for another day in Life with David. See you soon!